Hello and welcome. What has three decades of strict Islamic rule done to Iran, socially and politically? Well, as the country marks the 31st anniversary of its Islamic revolution, critics and supporters are recalling a shift in leadership which shocked the world and made political Islam a force to be reckoned with. But are all Iranians celebrating? And the people of Iran from all walks of life and all backgrounds, whether Islamic, nationalist or Marxist, had come together in the late 1970s to overthrow the Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, who had been ruling with an iron fist. Well, by 1979, the West-leaning government was replaced with an Islamic Republic under Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. But now many Iranians are questioning their leaders. After the elections of last summer, thousands took to the streets, demanding more freedoms and claiming that the results, which gave President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad the second term, were rigged. Dozens of protesters were killed and hundreds remain in prison. In the days preceding this 31st anniversary, Tehran warned it would not tolerate anti-government demonstrations and rounded up dissidents and journalists for good measure. But the turmoil seems destined to last. So today we ask what pressure are the people of Iran putting on their leaders to change and what chances there the government would consider a positive response. Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. You can send an SMS or an email, and we welcome your phone calls onto the show as well. well I'm joined now by Reza Pahlavi, the son of the last Shah of Iran and uh, heir to the Pahlavi uh, dynasty. Until this day, 31 years ago, he was known as the crown prince of Iran, but has lived in exile ever since. He joins us from Paris. Your Highness, good to have you with us. Mr. Khan, good evening. Good to be on your program. So what this, uh, looking at this uh, 31st anniversary, of course, uh, um, I wonder how you regard it. Has the, the passing of a uh, little over three decades softened the memory of what happened, certainly to your family? Well, you know, I've always uh, have been looking forward into the future, seeing in what way Iran's uh, uh, soulagement from this situation could ultimately culminate. And I think the uh, path that our country has witnessed over the past three decades, as you put it, has been a learning curve which I believe has made today's generation far better equipped than any generations preceding it in tackling the challenges of tomorrow, having learned tremendous amount of experience uh, sometimes under very dire and hard circumstances. But in terms of elements that are critical to achieve a democratic future, I suppose the best lesson learned for a Muslim country who had an experience with it for 14 centuries has been clerical rule or a theocracy of modern days, which has made the issue of how important a secular system mm -hmm. whereby separation of religion from government is pivotal and fundamental in order to achieve a democratic order is today understood by the masses and is in fact appreciated by the clergy, which has also suffered under religious rule in terms of losing its prestige and the kind of respect that was due to religion and the clerical establishment in the now, process. Now, before I, I look at what's happening uh, today in Iran, uh, let me take you back to 31 years and uh, remember when you were a student studying in America at the time as a teenager. Um, what do you recall of, just briefly, what do you recall of that time when basically uh, the news came through of what was happening in your home? Well, there was, of course, a climate of uh, political crisis, uh, part of which, which was due to the main reason why people were protesting for lack of political freedoms that existed at the time, although there were many other elements associated with that. Uh, what was quite vivid uh, uh, in my mind later, later on, and of course, <coughs> maybe I should not answer that now because you're asking what I thought then, mm -hmm. was clearly that there was an opposition mobilized against my father's regime but I'm not sure whether at the time they were quite focused as to exactly what would be the outcome. And uh, at the time, the, the main demand was the departure of my father or the uh, overthrow of, of his regime in favor of what they hoped would be a solution for the country under the leadership of an Ayatollah, a rather uh, obscure Ayatollah mm -hmm. at the time, where, which not, not many people really knew about, but somehow was prompted in the forefront and uh, hoping that maybe through that change, uh, uh, they will achieve uh, their goals. Now, I wonder, when you look at uh, the demonstrations of now uh, um, and those uh, third, three decades ago, a lot of people make a comparison and say that the demonstrations against your father parallel those uh, of today against the, the current regime. Do you see that parallel? Well, uh, when you see demonstrations on the streets, I will tell you what uh, is vividly different today. Uh, number one, let's not forget one thing. My father opted to leave the country 
to in order to avoid bloodshed and gave the order to the military not to directly intervene against the people, which facilitated the transition of authority from the previous regime to the current government, something that is quite different under the current regime. Also, what I will say is extremely uh, remarkable in the process is that so far, a, a, a quite an interesting degree of discipline has been observed by the anti-regime demonstrators and forces against it uh, that have restrained themselves from retaliating against security forces in violence. I have myself witnessed a number of footages that came from inside Iran visibly showing that when certain security forces were at numbers, such as element of the Basij, for example, uh, people did not retaliate against them and in fact let them go. And I think in that sense, uh, we have seen more and more elements from the security forces peeling away from the regime and showing sympathy and in fact even solidarity in some cases uh, with the people, uh, which is indicative of the cracks uh, from within. Uh, you can call it a parallel or comparison, but this is something we witnessed today in Iran as recently as uh, the last few hours and, of course, uh, within the past uh, two months, where, as you know, we had the celebration of Ashura in Iran, and, of mm -hmm. course, uh, uh, all of this has been sustained by this movement to use every opportunity and occasion to, uh, to maintain uh, and sustain the continuity uh, of the protest movement. Now, we have a caller on the line from Finland. Mohammed, thanks for joining us. What would you like to ask? Uh, well, uh, hello to everyone. Hi. Actually, my point is that uh, well, there, there, uh, there, there is a minority of people that are against the system. Okay, why you such a well? I respect your uh, your uh, news and everything, but why you just emphasize on such a narrow major, okay. uh, uh, population? And right. today it's, it's such a massive demonstration, okay? And you are just giving the wrong address. Okay, Mohammed, actually, that's an interesting point and a valid point, of course. And, and Your Highness, perhaps you know the Green Movement has gone. I should we should point out has gone out of its way to say that it actually supports the Islamic nature of the government, but but is looking for more civil liberties and freedoms. And I wonder if you you feel. I mean, Mohammed saying it's a very small resistance. Whether you feel that the, the way the Green Movement's going and saying it's supportive of the government, uh, the basis of the government, uh, that it's uh, that it's a common view among Iranians. Well, I think the best way I can answer the viewer's question is to say if the clerical regime believed this statement, why would they bother cracking down so severely and murdering our sons and daughters on the streets of Iran if they feel so secure that they're just a blemish or a minority? I beg to differ, sir. I think the majority of the Iranian people in 30 years have had enough with this regime because there's no aspect of Iranian life that has, that has been left unaffected in a negative sense by this regime, starting with women losing their rights to equality, not to mention religious minorities that have been persecuted, not to mention ethnic minor uh, communities in our country, need I say more, not to mention the economic situation that people are suffering under, problems with inflation, unemployment, no hope for the future, y youth in our country trying to, in some cases, fl flee from the country to maybe find a very a uh, crude job outside just to be able to breathe and make some living. The writing is on the wall. Uh, saying this from a distance is a sign of utter denial as to what is happening in our country. And I'm sure I'm not alone in witnessing what is happening today in Iran, not just in the main cities, but in the four corners of our land. Now, interestingly enough, though, there are a few things that seem to have improved under the, uh, the theocracies. Uh, the, uh, some of the political um, institutions seem to have more powers than they did before, and there's certainly more health care and education uh, across the population as well. So presumably there's also some benefits that the people have felt as well. I mean, I will, I will left, leave uh, public opinion in Iran to decide. The problem that we have, Mr. Khan, and I think all our viewers will appreciate that, is that there's no way that you can actually measure public sentiment when there's absence of public debate, or open debate for that matter. That, we know, does not exist. So rather than hypothesize about who thinks what, I think the first degree of certainty to know what people really want is to give them the opportunity to speak and to be free to decide and therefore to vote. Does that situation prevail in Iran today? Of course not. 
Therefore, I don't know if it matters whether we want to argue if the country was educated or as you placed it, some institution may appear to have more control. Bottom line is that you have a self-appointed representative of God on earth who decides who deserves to live and who deserves to die. And whoever challenges the system is called uh, someone who is, uh, is an affront to God and is worthy of capital punishment. I don't call that freedom. I don't call that progress. I'm sorry. Let's get Ali Reza on the line. He's in New York City. Uh, uh, go ahead, Ali Reza. Uh, yes, uh, I just had a comment for your guest. Um, I'm an Iranian-American, and I think in looking at your biography, and I've, I've looked into it a bit, I think your only qualification to lead Iranians is that you came from your father's seed. Um, from what I can tell, you have no success in business, academia, or anywhere else. And I deeply resent that you think that your royal lineage it gives you the right to be my leader. And I really wish that you would stop uh, pr uh, just aspiring to that position. I wish that you would just go away. Thank okay, you. Ali Raza, thanks. Let me, let me put to, to, to you, um, Johannes, what, what's, in terms of what you're doing now, what, is it that, what role do you see yourself playing uh, specifically now in, in the way Iran might change? And what sort of role do you envisage for yourself in the future, assuming there is a change? Well, my goal is to have someone for our latest caller to have the freedom to say exactly what he said in our own country, where today he cannot, about somebody like me or whoever else he has an issue with. I'm fighting the, for the freedom of opinion of every Iranian citizen, regardless of what that opinion may be. So therefore, I think it's the idea that I'm fighting for, which is really what I put on the table for the Iranian people to decide upon. Whether or not I'm qualified for the job is up to them to decide. Clearly, this particular individual doesn't have a vote for me, but that's fine. I think the people of Iran at the right time will have to decide that. Let's focus on where we need to go, however. Are we content with the circumstances in our country today? Are the people today, the young sons and daughters of this revolution today, the next generation that is suffering under this regime, asking anything less for their right to decide for themselves? And if so, isn't it our duty to help them achieve that goal. That's what I'm trying to do, and that's all I'm doing at this time. Let's, Therefore, let's, I'm not running for office mm -hmm. so that you question my qualifications. But focus on the message, and the message is, let's free Iran. You don't like the messenger, that's fine. Do you have the pro a problem with the message? Ask that question, rather. OK, Rowena's on the line from the UK. Rowena, what would you like to ask? Uh, it's an honor for me to speak to you. I'm a student of history at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and uh, my focus is mainly on Iranian history. But I'm very interested in your idea about freeing Iran. Do you think that the Iranian population today would be open to the idea of uh, you coming back, either as a monarch or as a political candidate? I'd like very much to hear your views on that. Okay. Now I'm going to ask your highness to actually hold fire on the answer there, because we have to take a short break, but I want to get that answer as soon as we return. So don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing the long-term impact of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, which took place 31 years ago, and examining how the government in Tehran is handling the demands for reform. Joining me uh, is Reza Pahlavi, the heir to the Pahlavi dynasty that ruled Iran for 74 years until the Islamic clerics took power in 1979. He's joining us from Paris. Sir, just before the uh, break, we had uh, Rowena in the UK asking if uh, you believe that the people of Iran uh, could, uh, could accept you or would take the view of you coming back either as a monarch or some kind of strong political figure. Well, look, uh, again, uh, let me focus on the job at hand today and the only mission that I have set for myself in terms of what I believe my compatriots expect from someone like me is to liberate Iran and bring it to a point that we can freely elect a government of our choice. The demand in Iran today is uh, in the greatest majority that I can think of uh, in the last 30 years uh, of people from different walks uh, of life and political persuasion seems to be consolidated around a common denominator, a democratic secular alternative and a parliamentary system of government. I think if the question is posed today in a national referendum, the majority of people would reject the current regime in favor of a change, at which point I think a constituent assembly would have to write a new constitution and debate the final form of this regime 
beyond the content of it being a democratic parliamentary system and leave that final choice to the people of Iran as to in what form this institution will be represented, either on the uh, parliamentary monarchy, for instance, or a parliamentary republic. That debate will have to take place at the right time. Therefore, I don't think that it is fruitful at this point uh, to uh, bring in divisive issues rather than issues that unite us all if we believe in democracy and human rights. That is, I think, the common denom denominator of most uh, freedom-seeking Iranians. Okay, Babak is on the line from Madrid. Babak, go ahead, please. Yes, um, um, uh, Mr. Pallavi is very um, clear about his vision, and I think it's very articulate. Uh, but my question is this. Um, in, in a country where its regime has, is willing to use force um, up to extreme um, levels, does he think that really a nonviolent uh, movement can succeed? Okay. That's a very uh, important question. And let me tell you why I am uh, uh, constantly insisting on the discipline necessary to succeed. The history of nonviolent movement has proven, for the most part, one thing for certain that violent scenarios of change seldom lead to democratic outcomes. On the other hand, most successful civil disobedience movements have reached a democratic outcome. Point number one. Point number two, a critical element in transition of power is the direct participation of coercive forces as part of that transition, if we want to avoid bloodshed. Therefore, there has to be an option for such elements, case in point the Iranian regime today, to be able to see a survival for themselves beyond this regime. If they may be fearful that they are facing a vengeful society, chances of them peeling away for such regimes would be much less, and therefore the road to recovery and freedom much harder and certainly much bloodier. Therefore, it is important not only to believe that it is achievable under nonviolent civil disobedience, but it is a critical point of achieving beyond this change an atmosphere of national reconciliation in which you have a general amnesty, and I would even add to that the banning of capital punishment for good, particularly mm -hmm. in the case of political, uh, if you will, uh, sort of crimes or whatever you want to call it. This has to be part of our uh, perspective towards the future. I'm looking at South Africa as a good example, and I think in that case I don't see why we couldn't achieve it. because. Uh, this is not just theory, but in practice, we have seen elements of coercive forces, such as some members of the Revolutionary Guards, beginning to show doubt and remorse. And let's not forget one thing. The same people who are today asked by this regime to fire bullets into the heads of our sons and daughters has gone to the war front, fought a war protecting our homeland and the life of the parents of the very same children that are asked to go and kill. I don't think that would be tenable. I know there will be a shift of position, and they will join the people at the very end. I have no doubt that the Iranian people will prevail. My entire effort in this is to try to bring that change at the least cost possible to our nation, both in terms of loss of life and in terms of its economic consequences. I cannot think of any other scenario but that of nonviolence, and I have yet to be proven wrong that the Iranian people cannot achieve it or that it is too futile to thought think in, in, in that direction. Now, we had a, an SMS a message that came from Kofi in the UK who says, does Reza Pahlavi think his father was a dictator? And I wonder how are you able to, to at least shed the baggage that uh, is carried with your father's name for having a very tough regime? But I think people who have an objective mind, including today's generation, realize very well that I have not genetically inherited the politics or the political circumstances in the era of my predecessor. I believe that I am my own man, and I have had a 30-year track record of my own. And I hope that people will judge me based on my actions and my thoughts rather than what happened at a time that I had nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. uh, my vision is towards the future. I have described clearly what it is that I uh, believe in, in terms of uh, the option for our country, what I'm prepared to do in that response. I'm doing it primarily as a responsible and concerned Iranian citizen and a patriot. And I've always said if it is up to my fellow compatriots to bestow upon me if they so choose or if they believe that I can play a higher role in, in Iran in the future to decide that then. Okay. But I know my mission now, 
And my mission is focused on bringing uh, a process of liberalization with the help of all Iranians that are committed to this common uh, joint effort so we can bring freedom to our country as soon as possible and give a chance for the people of Iran to decide in complete freedom what it is that they really want for themselves and their future. That's okay. all I can say at this stage, and that's the only focus of my, uh, my, on my mind ever since I started 30 years ago. Okay, Oscar is in Virginia with a question. Oscar, what would you like to ask? Oh, good afternoon. Uh, yeah. It's uh, such a pleasure to talk to uh, Your Highness. Uh, uh, my question was, Thank first you. of all, to answer Ali Reza from New York, is that at this uh, junction, we really don't have anybody who is more qualified uh, actually with a clean record and without any type of an agenda, uh, a personal agenda, I should say, except you, sir. And uh, I'm sure a lot of Iranians uh, would like to see that, uh, you know, you basically uh, try to organize some sort of a group so we can, uh, uh, you know, confront uh, this Islamic Republic in a more organized fashion. Okay. Uh, do you, sir, have any type of a plan uh, to uh, organize any type of a, you know, I guess, uh, a uh, group or what have you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, one of the chief concerns among the opposition, mm -hmm. both inside and at home, I mean inside the country and outside, is the fact that uh, since the regime appears to be uh, bent on trying to minimize any possibility for the current, at least visible, leadership of the movement to be effective at, uh, inside, there may in fact be some kind of a vacuum at some point right. in terms of the visible leadership. That doesn't mean that the movement will be curtailed. However, there may be a need for some reassembly of such forces mm -hmm. outside, and this is where I think the diaspora can get involved, right. and the Yanis? activists from abroad can be of assistance to the movement inside mm -hmm. and help con you know, create a contact between them and the outside world. I know you are. I have to ask time. your forgiveness because we are we're short on time. I thank you for your understanding. I do hope we have a chance to speak again. Good luck and thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for being with us, too, with your questions. Remember, you can follow the show on Facebook and see what we're up to there. You can give us your feedback on topics and post your questions and comments. On the next show, Nigeria's leadership crisis. Vice President Goodluck Jonathan has assumed full presidential powers in the absence of the country's elected president, Umaru Yar Adua. After sacking the country's powerful justice minister, Goodluck Jonathan says he'll tackle electoral fraud and corruption, but some say his assumption of power is illegal. Make sure you join us for that. We'll see you next time. I'm away. Anna Naida will be filling in for me. Join him for the next show.